Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Sara Giovannini. I work for the City Network Energy Cities, and I have the pleasure of being the moderator for this session today. Uh, we are going to discuss how local energy ownership can contribute to a uh, just and secure energy transition. Um, so, as we all know, we are dealing with the consequences of uh, the current energy price crisis. And this crisis exposed our dependence on fossil fuels and imported energy sources. So we want to uh, make sure that local governments and their inhabitants who are actually part of the solution have the necessary uh, means to uh, be uh, an active uh, uh, participant in the energy system. And so um, today we try to see how uh, they can be supported to play this, uh, their role in the energy market through the implementation of the clean energy packet provision and also uh, how could uh, the upcoming revision of the energy market uh, design uh, could impact uh, on their role. And during this session, we uh, are going to use Lido, so we also uh, want to uh, engage uh, you, our audience, uh, in person and also online. You can see the QR code that uh, will allow you to participate, to contribute to the session, and that you can use also to ask questions. Um, so here with me today, I have the pleasure of having uh, this great panel of speakers. So we have Adela Tesarova, the head of unit consumers, local initiative, and just transition in DG Energy from the European Commission. <laughs> Uh, Dimitri Katsaprakakis, professor at the Hellenic Mediterranean University in Greece. Uh, Vera Suljic, project manager at the Regional Education and Information Center for Sustainable Development in Southeast Europe. Stavrula Papa, policy advisor of Rescope EU. Ada Amon, chief advisor to the mayor of Budapest for climate affairs. And replacing the previous speaker who unfortunately had uh, a personal issue and couldn't be with us today, uh, Antoine Mathieu, who kindly stepped in, uh, energy uh, manager, uh, manager of the energy marketplace of Elia Transmission Belgium. So we thought that maybe uh, after the introduction of the speaker, we could see a bit who is in the room and online with us assisting the session. So if we could launch a short uh, Slido uh, for you uh, to tell us uh, who you are working for. So to get a bit an idea who, who is in the room, you have the information uh, at the link, uh, the QR code that we showed before. So please. Let's see, at the moment I see that everyone works for the public sector. Ah, no, okay, that's good. Ah, so we have quite a balanced participation between public sector, NGOs, some people in the energy community, some people working for the private sector, and companies too. That's great. Thank you for uh, some people from the academia. Thanks a lot. So I now give the floor to Adela <laughs> to uh, set the scene for our session. Thank you, Adela. Uh, many thanks, Sara. I'll pick up uh, on. Um uh, where you started. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, so um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has completely changed um, attitudes to energy in Europe and uh, the energy landscape in Europe. Uh, we are responding very decisively. Uh, we had to, in the short term, find new suppliers of fossil fuels, in particular gas, to replace Russian gas. And we are still working on it, but we have made huge progress. Three quarters of Russian gas have been so far replaced uh, with other sources, in, especially from Norway and from the US. And second, we are speeding up the green energy transition. We are much more uh, decisive on energy efficiency and on renewables, and we have seen a major increase in renewables in Europe last year. And very importantly, 61% of new capacity of renewables came from rooftop solar. So it's individuals, actually, small companies, big companies, uh, people investing in renewable energy. And that's a very, uh, very good trend, which, of course, brings us then to the topic of today. Uh, because one of the things we uh, hope to see uh, with, uh, um, with this revolution, which is currently happening in energy, uh, will be much more democratization of energy, much more decentralization of how energy is produced and much more uh, active engagement of consumers in the process of production 
uh, energy. And so um, the idea of democratization of energy, something which we have maybe before the crisis uh, seemed not so f much main mainstream, is really becoming mainstream. And hopefully, the interest of citizens in the topic of energy will stay, <laughs> which is, of course, not given. Because once energy prices uh, become more bearable, people will might move to other topics. Uh, but we have seen that the scare of big invoices have really woken up consumers. And all of a sudden, people became very interested in energy. And this is, of course, good because we need interested consumers so that they can participate in the transition and they can engage uh, with, uh, uh, with renewable energy uh, because that's, of course, the energy which is produced locally. And, uh, and therefore, it's, it's very easy for, for consumers to engage, to become active. And therefore, the concepts such as energy communities are becoming very popular. Yeah, we always say that the concept, of course, has been around for a long time. Uh, we had some difficulties in implementation. As um, many member states uh, have not advanced as much they, as they should. Uh, we are also working on uh, widening the possibilities for consumers to engage with energy. Uh, for example, the Commission proposed through the market design uh, to, to define the concept of energy sharing, which is uh, the most typical activity that energy communities do. And it is also a way for people to engage with energy, even if, for example, they don't join an energy community. So we are broadening the, the possibilities for consumers to be active. And it's, uh, so it's very important that all this new legislation and all the existing legislation gets fully implemented. Hence also the project that the RESCOOP, or the many projects on which RESCOOP, for example, is working to define barriers to energy communities and to help us progress with implementation of the legislation. So I will conclude <laughs> uh, to say that I'm really uh, very positive on the concept of energy communities and consumer empowerment. And I really hope that we will be able to use the momentum of the crisis to, to engage as many citizens as possible, to change the way people interact with energy, and to have much more active and positive uh, involvement of consumers. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Adela. <laughs> and now, speaking of a great project that Rescopio uh, is involved in, uh, we have some uh, um, presentations now. Uh, I, I suggest, Dimitris, you might want to start um, about one of the projects, indeed, that uh, you're involved in, called Life Loop, and how you are empowering, um, indeed, cities and people with giving them the right skills uh, for a should active I role. Uh, present my presentation now or speak about yes, Life Loop? Yes, yeah, yeah, please. You okay. can do your know. presentation. Okay. Now we're looking at it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all of you being, for being here, and thank you very much, especially Rescope, for, my, for, for this honorable invitation and for giving us the opportunity, the chance to present our work, what we have done in Crete. So I'm coming here, I am here as a representative of the United Energy Community, which was founded, as you can see, in a small town. It is named Arkalohori, a rather unknown uh, place at the center of the island of Crete. Uh, it was founded in uh, 2019 by 38 uh, founding members, but today we have reached more than 650 members, a figure that almost daily changes, uh, among which we have four municipalities and the regional authority of Crete and much more uh, legal entities. Our target is to undertake the principal, the basic role regarding the way that energy transition is going to be implemented in our island and uh, claiming the maximum possible benefits for the local citizens, economic, social, and developmental uh, benefits. What we have done so far, given the chance that, given the fact that uh, Crete so far remains uh, an island, although it has been interconnected with the mainland country in, since uh, 2021, we don't have, we didn't have since our uh, establishment any um, new open calls from a regulator. So we have just developed, just constructed two photovoltaic plants. You can see the nominal powers of both plants. Uh, with these two plants, more than 250 members of our community compensate their annual electricity consumptions with the production of the plants. What is more important is that in September 2021, our hometown, Arkalohori, was striken by a very strong earthquake. And um, it was um, estimated that more than 20% of the population was forced to change place of residence. 
So uh, we couldn't do nothing uh, less than trying to help our own community to recover from this situation. So what we did is that in the second photovoltaic plant that we have constructed, we have included 50 families, earthquake vic victims of low income in this plant, so they receive electricity free of charge without paying anything at all. And we are going to support 50 more families in our third uh, project. So in, so in this way, we are uh, uh, trying to make the first practical steps against energy po poverty in our island. For this, uh, for this project and in general for this action, we are, we are awarding in this city <laughs> some months ago, nine months ago, um, uh, by the European Commission in the frame of uh, European uh, Union Sustainable Energy Week 2022 and for the local energy action for this specific award. It was a great distinction for us and it gave us certainly hope, faith and strength to continue our efforts. Uh, in the future, we have also planned to develop the first commercial projects that will sell the electricity produced to the utility. Small photovoltaic plants, for example, with upper limits for the participation of our members, up to 10,000 euro, for example, per each individual, or to 20,000 euro per family. This, for example, participation will uh, give an annual income after taxes for each family, for example, at about 4,000 euro, so it we come at the payback period uh, close to five, uh, from five to six years. Also, we have already planned our first wind parks in places with high wind potential, more than 55% final capacity factor, uh, and we are trying now to, uh, to, to take to uh, ensure the first licenses, the first approvals from the involved authorities. Uh, it is very important for us that the Cretans uh, will be quite aware about what energy tr transition is, what are the risks, the options, the benefits that we can claim from this process only through our actual participation in that. So we have started with economic support of the Regional Authority of Crete, a very ambitious uh, capacity building project. It is going to start next September and it will last 18 months. Uh, more or less, it will um, we will deliver uh, during this project more than 100 physical info days through the whole island in municipalities, in schools, in uh, commercial, professional uh, groups and uh, associations, just like, for example, hotel uh, employees or municipal uh, employees, etc. Uh, so, what we want? We want from the Greek state uh, a, a truly supported, supportive uh, legal framework. We need. Uh, a clear framework. We need uh, priorities, licensing priorities from, uh, for the energy communities. We need our place. You can see in this uh, slide the map of Crete as it is today by five large size applications that have been submitted in the regulator from by uh, uh, big uh, large size investors. And actually, practically, they have already occupied almost all uh, most suitable locations for wind parks installations on the island. So practically there is no, sp no space left. These licenses are not only in Crete, of course, but they are all over the Greek insular territory because, you know, in Greek islands we have very high wind potential. So they had the application together with the construction of the project also to interconnect the islands with the mainland grid on the expenses of the investors. But now the Greek islands have been already interconnected on the expenses of the Greek state. So actually these uh, licenses or applications uh, should be recalled or rejected respectively. Practically we have applications under evaluation process in Greece for more than 10 years. It makes no sense. So we want, we want and we claim our space to be free. We want a distinction be between the real energy co communities. We have proposed, for example, the term energy communities of broad basis and uh, with specific arithmetic and qualitative criteria to distinguish them from the 1,400 energy communities that currently have been um, established in, the, in our country. Most of them, however, of very low number of members, 10 or 15 members. So we want for these large size energy communities, which are, are the real energy communities with clear um, developmental and social orientation, specific priority, licensing priorities and economic financial incentives support in order to be able to uh, establish their vision and their target. So 
I don't know if you are aware, but today we are, celebrate, so we are celebra celebrating the European Day of Music. So best wishes to all of you who are lovers of music and do not, cannot, could not live without it. And uh, I just would like to recall in your memory, in your memory that global song of, song of John Lennon, Imagine, and just to make you sure that down there in my place, in the southern eastern corner of Europe, we, we, we continue to imagine, and not only that, we are trying to work on turning our imagination into reality. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dimitris. So, indeed, it is very important to communicate on the benefit uh, of community energy. Uh, and today is not only World, uh, European Music Day, today is also Europe Solar Day which is the perfect introduction for me to, for VEDA actually's presentation, uh, as they are involved in a project called Balkan Solar Roof. So VEDA, you have the floor. <laughs> solar roofs. Solar so roofs. We, we hope to Sorry. have as many yes, roofs Yes, of course, not just one roof. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, I promise it will be a very short presentation. So after such beautiful presentation by Dimitris, I have a very high ladder to jump over. So uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to speak today and to share uh, what we have accomplished so far within the project, uh, which couldn't be possible without the support of OIKI, the European Climate Initiative funded by the G German go government, and together with uh, energy cities uh, and three other cities uh, from the Balkans, uh, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Serbia, we are working on this uh, project, which is I would say uh, a, a fine-tuned name, also Balkan Solar Rus, so you can imagine uh, what is the uh, project about. So, um, speaking about the region of, of the countries we are working in, so it's a pretty sunny uh, place, especially in the northern parts of the countries, uh, even though there is not of that potential that much uh, being utilized so far. So, uh, we are hoping to address one of some of the barriers which are hindering uh, investments uh, in, in, in this regard. So usually citizens play uh, historically two roles in the energy sector. One is consumption and the other one is paying electricity. Somebody maybe even doesn't pay. But uh, what we want to make is that people think that they get involved in decision making as one of the examples like Dimitros just explained for the wind examples and also to invest. Uh, we truly believe that the energy transition on a large scale can be only possible if it's economically viable, not just financially, but economically. So it has to have uh, a lot of benefits which go beyond financial ones, social, environmental, etc. And through this project, we want to showcase this, that it's really possible to uh, achieve those benefits at local communities. Because the benefits, even good or high or low or whatever, the people who are living in those local communities, those who are live with those benefits. And actually, they are the most interested to have those benefits as high as possible. So through a campaign, uh, and this is the actually key focus of the project to um, launch a campaign in the three cities, uh, city of Poreć, which is in Croatia, Mostar, which is in Bosnia, and Kragujevac, which is in uh, Serbia, to, uh, to mobilize citizens, to gather them, and to uh, kickstart a um, wide campaign within these uh, cities to uh, have solar roofs, both PV and thermal, uh, both on public and private roofs uh, in those cities. So, and the campaign is already ongoing. So uh, we are in the second year of the project and we have achieved uh, so far uh, many of installations, but many of them are uh, coming in the coming period. So definitely uh, beyond these campaigns, what we want to is we want to equip people working in the municipalities with knowledge and skills so they can continue further. So Balkan Solar Roofs will come to its end in November this year, but after this uh, date we want to have these com communities empowered and also skillful to continue on this path. Not just them, but also other follower cities, so we um, organize a campaign beyond the cities which are involved and are calling those cities to sign the charter, the Balkan Solar Roofs Charter, and so far we have uh, 17 of them signed, so they can also utilize the knowledge and, and skills we are developing through this uh, project. So, uh, just a uh, few facts what we have uh, achieved so far. Um, the key output for a wider audience, I would say, 
It's the pool portal, Balkan sol Solar Roofs, which is openly accessible. So where you can, of, of course, find many of the uh, figures and facts what we what we have uh, achieved so far, but also it's a good way for other cities to use it and to use a specially uh, prepared poster tool uh, for catalyzing uh, solar projects within the community. So it doesn't have to be uh, one of those three cities; can be any other others. Um, we have organized a bunch of uh, events within the community, so uh, all of the communities have really engaged uh, with the local population and thereof also started with uh, filling the gap of awareness, which is a huge gap uh, in all of the countries uh, in the Balkans. Um, finally, we will have this conference in Kragujevac in Serbia on the 27th and 28th of September, so uh, and hopefully we will have uh, even more better news to share uh, at this event. So some of the challenges uh, in the region are common, some of them are uh, country specific, for instance in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is most probably the most uh, administratively uh, complicated uh, city, uh, state in uh, Europe or even abroad, um, because it has its state level, then it entities above that, then there are cantons, then you have municipalities, and on all these different levels you have a level of decision making, which is in, in, the, in the end slows down decision making. Um, for instance, the renewable energy community's uh, concept is just being recognized in one part of the country, in the other part uh, of the country it's not, so the prosumer concept is not institutionalized yet, so and it, it's, a, it's a great uh, barrier uh, in this regard to, to uh, scale up solar investments. In Croatia, they have uh, this concept, uh, renewable energy com uh, communities in place in the legislation, but they also have uh, citi uh, citizen uh, energy communities, which is sometimes confusing on the ground. So what is what? Uh, not just the people, but also the decision makers. and at the end you have no examples uh, to showcase. So um, in Serbia, uh, it's a highly centralized country in, in, in contrast to Bosnia and Herzegovina where the major decisions are being made at the state level, whereas local authorities have very, very low level of autonomy and also budgets to incentivize. So with this in mind, uh, we thought how we can, as a, as a project, help to address. We cannot certainly solve all these barriers, but we can, to some extent, help. So definitely through educational campaigns, uh, we can uh, bring this topic cl uh, closer to every citizen in the three cities. But also what we find most important to showcase. So stop just telling, but also showcasing that this is really, really possible so that people just behind their corner can see that uh, these investments are taking place and to demonstrate what the benefits are for them, but also for the community as a whole. And last but not least, by increasing the number of the PVs on the roofs, so we, we uh, hope that this will trigger more and more in initiatives uh, in, a, in a very promising region, as I said at the beginning. So there is a lot of technical potential in those countries. Unfortunately, the market potential is uh, still low because of the many barriers which are hindering it. So and I was also asked to, to uh, stop with a quote, uh, which I like to, to uh, use it in a different way, but this is the original one So uh, from Albert Einstein, so that uh, if we repeat the same way what we are doing and hope with an, uh, another outcome that calls to purity, how Einstein would call it. So we have to change the way we are also thinking, but also the way we are doing. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that. <laughs> so we heard different challenges already. We heard the legislative framework that is really not supporting. We, we heard about the issue of skills, the issue of land grabbing, uh, the issue of uh, um, supporting, uh, uh, providing resources to support real communities and to support local authorities in, uh, on that want to work on this topic of community energy. Now I go, maybe I go to Ada with a question. Um, so do you see the same challenges in your area? And also, uh, maybe you think that local authorities in Hungary are equipped to support and lead uh, the energy transition? Well, we certainly uh, started to supporting uh, this uh, path. And uh, partly because, I guess, uh, energy is a very... Um, how to say, 
it's very basic in terms of also in our concept of democracy. And in a country where you can win elections and in Central Europe as such, where you can win elections by pressing down energy tariffs, it is very important. So energy is power in the sense of political term also. Um, so therefore, uh, bringing it down to the people to not just generating their own and relying their own energy, but also lowering their own uh, expenses on or spending on, on energy and also um, understanding what it takes to connect, to, to connect to the grid, to the, all these technicalities uh, and not, not uh, leaving people in the shade or, or keeping them in, in, in that, uh, you know, unawareness of, of what energy or a kilowatt hour is about. So this is, this is something what local level municipalities local governments can uh, you know uh, repower people in this in this sense uh, I guess and uh, yes also I, I think I'm here partly because the OIKI uh, the, the German government was so generous to support this initiative what we started uh, on on solar power how to how to uh, integrate solar power in 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 the city and I heard really a uh, few times about city level security of supply but I think uh, strengthening the security of supply of big cities would have a huge impact on the security of supply of a whole country or the continent as such. Uh, like Budapest is using 25% of the electricity on less than 1% of the land of the country. So it's like you have to bring every force electron into Budapest, what is generated or consumed, consumed in, in Hungary. So it has a huge impact on how to how we relate to electricity or how to electricity which is even getting more and more important in our energy portfolio as the main carrier of 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 uh, you know supporting our energy uh, demand so yeah and partly this is uh, what we are going to talk about uh, if you may uh, if you allow me to to uh, advertise one of our new events uh, in two weeks uh, in Brussels, and uh, we would like to 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 embrace this I idea of strengthening the continent with city uh, self reliance, or or you know um, uh, increasing our self reliance in cities. And I'm sure that most of our cities, big cities. Uh, has a very good infrastructure already in place as these grids are strong enough to uh, integrate and, and use the, the energy which is generated within the city. Obviously, we have other issues and there are many obstacles, legal, technical. Architects are not really fond of a solar panel, as I learned over the last four years. Um, so, so we have to we have to come over a lot of things. What uh, needs to be done, but first of all, um, and probably we will get back to you to energy communities. But, but I think we are not there yet in Hungary because <laughs> because of some other issues we have to cope with uh, on the way. Ada. Uh, indeed, um, I, I love that you said energy is power, it's also political power. Mm -hmm. And indeed, uh, in, a, in Energy City, we make a strong point also about uh, the need for cities to master their own need. 
And I think in a situation like the one you are living in Budapest, it would be a great uh, political advantage too. <laughs> uh, but speaking, going back to speaking about challenges, uh, um, we have a, a Slido poll for uh, you uh, about indeed the main energy challenge uh, in your country. I don't know if it appears on the screen. Yes. Uh, so if you want to answer that, we can put more challenges to the table uh, for this discussion. Let's see. I mean, not that we didn't hear about any challenge already, but let's see. A grid access, of course. <laughs> we knew this was coming, affordability. Utilities, instability of supply, financing. I see many people mention grid access and affordability. Permitting is too slow. Upfront cost, acceptance, which is also a very big issue when it comes to renewables in general. Legacy infrastructure, capacity building energy democracy. Well, <laughs> I, I suggest we keep this uh, slide on our screen if possible, because we might want to go back to it uh, during this discussion. Um, but maybe, um, Adela, you want to uh, comment maybe on and maybe tell us uh, how the market design reform on the, on the updated renewable energy directive uh, could address uh, these challenges or some of them at least. Yeah. Um, so, of course, uh, the Commission has been working um, uh, working hard last year on speeding up permitting procedures. That concerns mainly big projects, of course. Um, can you put back the slide? <laughs> Sorry. Can you keep the slide uh, <laughs> so, we have been working a lot on permitting, and the Renewables Directive has been now agreed. The revised Renewables Directive. So there is a um, um, lot of emphasis on, on speeding up permitting procedures, go, going to these go-to areas, and and uh, and um, yeah, making sure that big renewables project can be uh, introduced faster, which might not necessarily help with the public acceptance, though. Mm. Um, hence, also the importance of energy communities as a way to engage people. And if people are engaged in the project, they have a different attitude of to it. Course. And of course, energy communities can be also about wind, and it can be even offshore wind. Um, and then the other topic which keeps appearing a lot is the grid access. Um, and we have colleagues here who can comment on that. Uh, I think the, the issue here is that we've been talking for a long time about decentralized renewables. But now, finally, we have them, right? And we have a lot of progress on the ground. And we will have a lot of electric cars. And we will have a lot of PVs that people will want to install, and they will want to get access to the grid. So this is a big challenge for our DSOs. <laughs> and uh, it's very good to have the DSOs on board, uh, because I think they will be one of the prim primary targets of everyone um, uh, to help us um, to speed up the transition. We really rely a lot on the DSOs. Uh, what else? Yeah, lack of skills. Of course, uh, that's also an issue. Um, lack of skills on all fronts, right? like lack of skills on the supply side, but also on the demand side. Because if people want to engage with renewables, they need certain skills, as, uh, as you mentioned for, 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 for on the case of Budapest. right? Or uh, Obviously, the, uh, the consumer who wants to be active on energy um, needs to learn new skills. Um, and so hence, we have issue of skills everywhere. Yeah. We speak a lot about skills related to the workforce. We speak less, in my opinion, about skills related to the consumer, to the active consumer. And it's, of course, also a challenge, especially the lower the income of people, the less they might be equipped already to engage with energy. I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you, Adela. And, uh, the issue of skills is also very real for local governments. Huh? We have yes. uh, uh, this capacity. Exactly. We have this campaign in energy cities called Local Stuff for Climate, which really brings uh, also the topic of uh, skills uh, uh, for, for local authorities that are willing to play their role, but sometimes they don't have the necessary resources and uh, also in terms of human resources and knowledge to, to do this. And 
Maybe, uh, Stavrula, uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, recommendation that you might want to share with us uh, on how to address uh, these challenges. Sure, happy to intervene. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today and it was indeed very inspiring to see two concrete examples from the ground and also your upcoming plans, Dimitri, with Minoan that is growing now as a community. Um, you both actually mentioned, and we see it in the word cloud as well, uh, the issue of maybe lack of legislation, especially in the eastern part of Europe, in the Balkans, or unstable legislation in some cases. And I would like to stick a bit to that, because in Rescue PU we have been monitoring the transposition process of the provisions for energy communities around Europe. Uh, we have uh, created a transposition tracker tool that you can see the development. And we see that even five years after the clean energy package, there is a huge implementation gap still in several countries, which is of course a huge barrier for uh, citizens to get, uh, to, to get access to energy communities. And maybe to put things into perspective and share a bit of a background uh, on the context of energy communities, for the first time during the clean energy package, there was this acknowledgement of energy communities as a market actor and the acknowledgement from the EU of um, their important role, uh, the important role that they play on a successful energy transition. We have, uh, Adela, you already mentioned some numbers on the production of energy from active consumers. We have already research before the clean energy energy packets and actually the, I would refer to and I always refer to the C Delft study that was conducted already in 2016 that showcases the huge potential that such initiatives have. So we have numbers saying that by 2050 at least half of the European citizens could be producing their own energy and this could concretely mean that they uh, they could meet 45% of the electricity demand by then. So we're talking about a huge potential. We already see a lot of energy communities being active also in times of crisis um, and in times of the energy crisis. Several of our members can bring a lot of examples of how they dealt with the crisis. We have and we use the example of Eco Power because it is impressive that they had enough production to supply to their members, and because of the fact that they are not for profit, they don't aim at profit making, they managed for the whole duration of the energy crisis to keep the prices low for a, a considerable amount of uh, households in Flanders. And I actually noted a very interesting example from the session before, from the use of session just before, um, that an another member participated in Energie Solidaire, um, and they are actually very much active on also energy poverty alleviation, which grew a lot during the energy crisis. And they have collaborated with Enercop, uh, our member in France, and they included uh, the possibility for a micro donation on the energy bills that the members of Enercop could pay. So they could give one, two euros more when they paid their bill. And then they managed to gather 180,000 euros uh, last year which then distributed for to energy poor households through NGOs that are working on the topic. So we see it and we have plenty of examples um, already on the contribution of energy communities. We see a lot of interest from citizens to set up their own initiatives. So I think now that the electricity market design re and the reform that the commission proposed and is now being negotiated is a great example to also decide and ask ourselves um, simpler questions. Like, um, do we want to move faster towards a more decentralized energy market? Or do we want to give the possibility to citizens to concretely um, own their production and be able to reduce their prices or control the prices that they pay? And I think if the answer is yes, and if this, this is the way we want to move towards, it is very important to make sure that energy communities and local actors in general can participate in the market without discrimination. 
And on this regard, um, I would also like to officially launch today um, some policy recommendations that we worked on uh, a Horizon project, uh, the SCALE project, SCALE 2030-50. We worked with colleagues, uh, Energy Cities is also participating, we have uh, other partners from five different countries, and we worked on dedicated policy recommendations at the EU level, but also at the national level, so concretely for national policymakers. And I would like to raise some, may maybe more for today's session, uh, I will focus on the market design <laughs> recommendations, and I'm happy to discuss those with you and hear more about uh, your, your views on that. Um, First of all, I would, uh, we really appreciate the fact that the consumer impairment is integrated as a principle of the market design reform. So this is very important already. What we feel that is still missing um, is the inclusion and the prioritization of local ownership of renewables production and supply as also a principle in the electricity market design. And maybe just to make things simple on what I mean with local ownership. Um, we have now very ambitious renewable energy uh, targets set with the Renewable Energy Directive at the EU level, at the national level. So this will need an unprecedented rollout of renewable installations. And uh, a lot of those installations, if not most of those installations, will be uh, in rural areas. So a lot of local communities will be impacted by those projects. And Dimitri already mentioned the case of Crete and the case and what you're experiencing. Um, so what we, we want to see in this market design is that those communities and those local uh, actors have the possibility to participate, to own part of these installations and to be able to uh, self-consume and also uh, do different activities with uh, this production. So this concretely, this principle could be concretely materialized through maybe priority access to space, maybe priority access to the grid or uh, grid capacity. Um, and it can also constitute a legal basis for some other proposals that we have in the market design, for instance, on the provisions on energy sharing that was already mentioned. Um, we definitely appreciate uh, the commission's initiative to include more provisions and provide more cl legal clarity on this new on this activity because we were the previous years uh, we heard a lot of different terms being used also at the national level uh, peer to peer uh, self consumption collective self consumption energy sharing and there was always a confusion of what its term means concretely and how it can be used by citizens. So we do see the potential of this activity to contribute to uh, citizens being able to lower their prices. We still think that the definition of such needs some, um, um, let's say, changes or some work. For instance, and I don't want to get too technical, but with regards to the geographical proximity that uh, is already on the proposal, it sets, it's being set at the bidding zone. Uh, we think that that doesn't necessarily account for the different use cases. For instance, for collective self-consumption, we think it makes better sense to define it at an administrative unit level. A bidding zone in Europe it can be a whole country. Um, and in some cases, because there is now a proposal to set it at the distribution level, but for instance, in Germany, they have close to 900 DSOs. So that could be very narrow as well. Um, but yeah, our main ask on energy sharing is to make sure that local actors and energy communities can participate. And co concretely, we uh, want to see what we call a bike lane. So a bike lane means technical assistance. Uh, it means simpler procedures for energy communities to be able to do energy sharing, information sharing. And again, as I said, and we see how important it is from the example of Minon, uh, priority access to public space and capacity to the grid so that those initiatives are able to participate in such activities. Um, I won't go into all the different <laughs> elements on energy sharing. I won't stick to that m uh, much. Maybe on the Q&A section, we have the opportunity to discuss it more. But we really also want to see uh, more transparency 
on the procedures of the system operators. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to your intervention on, on this regard um, and the data exchange that will make it a lot more easier to do energy sharing activities and projects. Um, and we also think it's very important to allow for smaller actors like energy communities to be able to participate also in power purchase agreements. So provide guarantee schemes, make them more accessible to to smaller actors. Yeah, I'll stop here. I feel <laughs> I talk too much, um, but yeah. Savrula. And anyway, the, the recommendations uh, Savrula just mentioned are available. Uh, I'm pretty sure by now Energy Cities uh, Twitter and Rescopio Twitter already share them, uh, but you will also find them on the website of the project Scale 20, 30, 50. Um, yes, indeed, Savrula, you mentioned uh, the issue of energy sharing and the need of this uh, bike lane also. And recently we spoke with our uh, members in the context of the market design. And uh, this is also something that came up as a, a very specific need for local authorities, clarity, especially on procurement procedure. Uh, in the end, there might be a lot of uh, willingness at local level from citizens, from local authorities uh, to uh, develop energy community, to uh, set up community energy project. But then there is also a lot of uh, worries about uh, the what is legally feasible. Uh, or normally, innovators are the ones that then are on the spot and find themselves uh, uh, in the risk to be liable. Uh, so it's also uh, something that should be definitely addressed, uh, aside from, of course, the administrative uh, hurdle. But indeed, grid access, uh, uh, it's something that we saw on the board before. Uh, it's something that we keep hearing also from our member, this lack of transparency, this, this need to have a more, uh, say, direct connection and relations also with the district system operator. Today we don't have district system operator though. Today we have some transmission system operators, so we are talking about uh, higher voltage. Uh, but what I would like to ask you, Antoine, is uh, why uh, a transmission system operator uh, should be concerned with energy communities? Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. A uh, bit last minute, but I'm really happy to be a part of this panel, So um, um, and also happy to at least relieved to see that so many people are not sleeping at night for the same reasons as I am. Probably for, from a uh, other uh, perspective, huh? so um, um, as, as is noticeable here, um, I'm from the system operator side, uh, but in the end, what we want, the empowerment of um, the consumer, is also th something that we need um, at system operator level. At distribution level, which I'm not, I'll come back to the grid access and the hurdles that you can um, um, uh, encounter there, uh, but also at the transmission level. I'll give just one anecdote. Um, um, in the past weeks, uh, was Easter weekend. Uh, there was so much uh, solar production um, in Belgium that in the end, nobody wanted it anymore. There was no consumption available anymore for um, um, uh, absorbing uh, the generation. And today we cannot just switch off all these PV uh, installations. So it's really difficult for us as a system operator, uh, and especially a transmission system operator, to keep the balance between generation and um, uh, consumption, um, especially with this intermittency. So um, indeed, what we are looking for is um, flexibility. We need people to consume um, energy when uh, energy is available. So when the, there's an abundance of energy, that's really what we have in mind. And I've been working on this for quite a while now, um, uh, a lot of sleepless nights, but also very interesting um, uh, discussions. And uh, of course, we also believe that it's not always the system operator that needs to take any direct action towards the end consumer, we, there is also a role to play for intermediates. And that is the role that my uh, co-panelists here, I think, um, uh, play. And uh, we also uh, think that we need to um, provide these um, uh, commercial actors to um, unlock that flexibility on our behalf to provide them with the right tools. That's exactly what uh, my, my, my neighbor, sorry, Stravula, um, has, has mentioned before. Um, so really looking at what are the elements, what, which are the barriers that you encounter to unlock that flexibility, to empower the, um, the, 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 the consumer, um, uh, can we solve as system operators? Uh, there's a lot. You can see on, or you could see on the Slido, uh, there's a lot of things that are related um, uh, to the system operations. Um, but um, I would like to focus on two main uh, uh, points. Um, um, and then um, um, uh, there's a third one which will come after. But the two main barriers which are at the center of our uh, consumer centric vision uh, is really looking at how can we make sure that there is a value that can be created of that uh, flexibility that you would provide to the system 
to the overall system. Uh, and when I'm talking about value, uh, it's not all, only about monetary value. When to create um, um, or exchange some energy with your neighbor is not only about um, uh, how much euros can I win from it. There is the social aspect, there is the green aspect, which we are also um, uh, uh, working on. Uh, so flexibility uh, and the value that you give to flexibility uh, can be different from every consumer. So that's something that uh, also lives uh, into our minds. So access to data, um, and there's a lot of barriers with that. So um, it's, it's not an easy one. Um, there is a lot of uh, things that are related to the um, um, yeah, connectivity, um, the installations, the, the meters. So I'm really happy to see that the, uh, some policies are being um, 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 uh, drafted ab about that. Um, so um, uh, that's that's one aspect. So the connectivity, but also on the, uh, um, uh, the 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 model itself. So the financial model. How what is the value of data? We today, as system operators, we don't need only the data that is available at the head meter because that is quite easy to get. Um, not we don't have it directly, but with our distribution system operator colleagues who are responsible for, for this task, especially in, in Belgium and Germany, because Elia is Belgium and German group, um, we can have a look at uh, how to get that data at the head meter. But it's really behind the meter, that commercial data that sits within the, the some data holders. Uh, we want to unlock that as well. We want to make sure that the data owner can provide uh, its own data, liberate that to any service provider it needs, and then unlock fl um, flexibility. So we're work working on that with our ecosystem, um, looking at um, um, uh, further more into data spaces Etc. So that's some um, uh, elements that we're working on. The second thing is the uh, that um, um, uh, value, uh, as, as I explained, um, and all of that should allow um, services to emerge to compete behind the meter. So we want um, uh, some competition. Um, of services on the um, 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 of how to manage solar panels, of how to manage uh, EVs, of how to manage your, your heat pump. So basically, that the the cost also for the end consumer would drop, but also competition would increase innovation, increase also the quality of that um, uh, service that is provided to the um, uh, end consumer. So um, that's a bit how we tackle or how we try to tackle uh, these barriers and really going um, into a concrete uh, use case every time with the end consumer. We have this broad ecosystem. System. People are happy to work with that, so um, uh, we work with uh, startups, we work with scale-ups, with incumbents, and try to have that ecosystem around that um, so that we can uh, build and remove those barriers as soon as uh, we can. They have to be removed at the same time. It's not that like you can work on data or on the market value or the value of flexibility um, uh, in a sequence. You need to work um, on them at the same time, and that's what we, um, we try to, uh, to do at Ilia. Thanks a lot, Antoine. Well, any immediate reaction from the other speakers on this? Maybe, yeah. this. <laughs> Maybe reaction on the flexibility aspect, because some of our members are um, indeed trying to engage more in flexibility services. Um, but it's still a bit on a pilot phase. Um, do you work concretely maybe with some energy communities? I don't know. Um, on, on provision of flexibility from those initiatives? So, um, we're, um, there, there's two things. So um, on the distribution level or distribution system operators have some initiatives also um, that exist. Uh, we try at looking at some uh, model mechanism that is working more broadly uh, among regions, among distribution system operators as well, and in different use cases, not only the communities. So there is examples in Belgium uh, where you can find those uh, and where um, uh, uh, that, that's one element. Uh, on the other side, we're also looking at um, how can um, communities, smaller players also start uh, playing a role into entering or being faced with the energy markets uh, and also um, um, uh, taking up the imbalance <laughs> risk that they would have. I'm not mm. going to go too much into technicalities, but uh, also um, uh, upon them. How can we use um, uh, do that, uh, but al always um, 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 making sure that this, the grid security is also uh, um, safeguarded? Thank you. So in uh, unless anyone has uh, additional uh, replies or want to comment on any other topic, I think we can have a look at the questions that came up from the audience. Um, I will go in order. So we have the first one. How do you handle energy sharing in your energy community schemes if you do and how to integrate energy sharing within electricity market design? Uh, I don't know who this question is addressed to, but I think uh, maybe we can go to Vedad. 
or uh, Dimitris. I guess this is for you. Yeah, because you have a direct yeah. involvement in an energy community. Maybe. So, uh, regarding, of, of course, the first photovoltaic plants that we have, we have constructed, as I said in my presentation, these are two projects that operate under the so-called net metering mode, which means that the produced electricity is compensated with the consumption of the involved members in these parks. So um, how we do this, we open a call and we say whoever who is interested, um, send us uh, your electricity bills and we will tell you how much power you will need in order to fully compensate on an annual basis your electricity consumption. We inform the members that uh, send us, that show the first um, interest and of course on the cost. So each member undertakes the cost for the purchase of the corresponding power that uh, is, is required to compensate the consumption. So um, after that, we uh, declare the participation of each involved member regarding first the number of the of the of the of the um, uh, connection. Uh, that's what we de we declare the, with the, to the utility, and the utility make the makes the conversation between for the, for each specific member. That's how we share the electricity in the in the involved member. It is done automatically from the utility regarding the first projects which are net metering. Where we're going, when we will go to the commercial projects that will sell electricity to the grid, it will, of course, depend on the participation of each member on the, um, on, on, on the investment, of the, on the, in, the, in the initial investment of the project. Okay. I, I don't know if it is yeah, understood. I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's clear, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and as Dimitris already explained, um, you put your solar <laughs> solar park. Each of the members, based on their consumption, they own part of like a percentage of it. And then it's the supplier in 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 this case that does the calculations. Mm -hmm. um, this now there is actually now new legislation that was passed in March, just just very recently, that includes some changes on the virtual net metering scheme and on the legislation on energy communities. So on the list, uh, latest developments, uh, I think if people are interested, we will also publish soon member state reports in the energy communities repository. Um, so this will be the latest developments on the Greek legislation. Thank you, Saurula. How are the 50 families that receive electricity for free connected to the grid? Can you explain more how it works in practical terms? Of it's all for Dimitris today. Yes, <laughs> it's my pleasure. So, uh, yes, first of all, I have to explain that each member is already connected to the grid. Each involved member in the parks, in the plants, has its own connection. So we don't make new connections. The photovoltaic park is connected to a different place where it is installed, and each, each consumer, as I said, Stavrula uh, previously, actually we apply the so-called virtual net metering, which means that the, the plant is somewhere uh, centrally installed in a specific space, 400 kilowatt or one megawatt the second one, and in the second, for example, plant, 210 or 20 members are involved, participate. So the produced electricity is injected in the grid, and it is compensated with consumption of each different member. Now, regarding specifically the 50 families, of course, th these families are also connected to the grid, but what makes the difference is that they didn't pay any fee, any initial cost for their participation in the project. That was practically covered by the regional authority of Crete, which is the main, one of the main members of the, of the community, and also from the community itself. So that makes that made the difference that they will receive electricity without paid anything uh, for their participation in the plant as all the other members have done. For, for I, I correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not uh, a tech, uh, on the technical side, but to, to, let's say, simplify, maybe oversimplify, it's like a discount on the invoice for the family that are connected, That's right. right? That's what net metering is about, just to also Which for people like me that are not. more than 70%. Okay, so you it's a considerable pay amount. some taxes and rates for the use of the network, something like mm -hmm. that. Just to specify that the Greek legislation 
can be considered, it has a good element on energy poverty alleviation because in the legislation for energy communities, it is mentioned that part of this electricity, as you are implementing in Minoan, can be provided for free to energy poor households without the need for them to be a member in the community. So the legislation allows this. Uh, mm -hmm. Overall, concept. Greece has a very favorable, uh, uh, compared to other, uh, do you think is compared to other is a very it's more favorable legislation on energy poverty specifically uh, on energy community uh, and then yeah on energy poverty specifically what do you think I have to admit that yes we have done some very specific steps but I say as I said in the interview previously not here we have some more distance to cover to reach our final destination mm -hmm. there are still some crucial issues that we have to to remedy to to, to treat. Mm -hmm. And, and Vedat, how is the situation in, uh, in other member states, maybe in the member states that you work with in the Balkans? So in Croatia, as it's a member state, it's similar also like in Greece, but also uh, given the fact that all the Western Balkan countries, including Bosnia and Serbia, which are part of the project, are signatories of the Energy Community uh, Treaty. So we uh, are obliged and we fully align our legislation with just a little, uh, let's say, handicap in time uh, in, in, in comparison to the EU states, so uh, to the European uh, Union. So uh, in Serbia, there is uh, net metering in place and also in Bosnia and Herzegovina and part of Republika Srpska and one of the entities is in place in Federation Bosnia and Herzegovina and the draft legislation is being prepared and we are waiting for its, uh, its pending in adoption. Okay, thank you. In the meantime, I saw that we have new questions from the audience. Um, what are the challenges for community proofing urban areas, especially related to energy democracy? Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to. Savrula, maybe? Or. Sure. <laughs> or maybe Ada, you can also or Ada, bring the in perspective in of Budapest, the municipality. Yeah, I don't know what proofing is. It's uh, basically, related it's, to it's just a way of saying, um, so how would you uh, favor, uh, how, how, what are the challenges to favor uh, oh, community okay. energy in urban areas, in your opinion? Uh, you can mention the one for Budapest. Yeah, I, I have mean, plenty from our members, yeah, but me too. I can... Yeah, following follow upon this uh, line of how the member states are uh, transposing the, the energy community legislature, set of legislations, uh, it, I mean, in Hungary it's not happening. So what we are trying to do, we whenever we are about to set up an energy community, we try to avoid the term energy community in order to <laughs> make space for that. Because you can imagine how dubious uh, this term would be to our government, like self-reliance or... <laughs> um, Older times. Yes. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, um, but but on the other hand, I know several projects where, you know, local like uh, real small communities or or uh, uh, how to say it's not squatting, but but when when old buildings are taken over by uh, a group of people and they are trying to do some really community-related um, uh, activities there, and then they create energy communities uh, having their own energy efficiency uh, measures in place, and uh, also uh, solar and geothermal and stuff. So I, I see the I see the space for it in an urban area and also what I can say that there are buildings where for example solar is not permitted so I mean do these people still have the right to have their own renewable uh, I mean they still have so probably other other roofs are also there to to serve as a platform for them to invest and and take their own shares in uh, in the energy transition in this way, so yeah, we are thinking of a lot of different uh, 
ways how to involve mo the more people into the energy transition, also in urban uh, areas, uh, especially in Budapest, because just one other sentence. For me, who is responsible for climate and environmental issues in, in Budapest, I don't really care who uses that energy, really. What makes sense and the most important for me is to decrease the energy demand, the, and, and especially the energy demand coming into the city mm -hmm. and based on fossil. So uh, I'm sure that a city can, can absorb the generated electricity because we use a lot of uh, electricity for public transport we use a lot of electricity to to uh, for a lot of different things uh, so so i'm sure it can be you know sucked up by by the consumers at any time really so that's why um, it is uh, an important thing to to make to make the space and 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 uh, the room for for this and and I don't want to complain about the Hungarian government that they are not so very uh, uh, reflective and and uh, yeah they're not uh, they're rather creating a confusion around uh, renewable uh, electricity and renewable anything than. Uh, a clear path for anybody who would like to be in part of that that uh, yeah investing or something yeah so. so we we tend to go back to the issue of the enabling framework yeah. uh, as one of the main challenges both for local level and for energy communities in general Adela you wanted to Can I come come on this point yeah. um, as we have been uh, mentioning the situation in different member states um, um, I wanted to say that I think one of the blockers, especially in maybe Central and East European countries, where the retail market has not yet been liberalized, and when there is a strong price regulation in retail, this is a blocker because uh, by protecting consumers, the very strong consumer protection policies, you know, retail price regulation to keep prices low. We mentioned Hungary, but it's not only Hungary, there are other countries like that. There is no real need for consumer empowerment, yeah, because consumers are just overprotected against, I would say, against their own benefit ultimately. Mm -hmm. So that's one factor. Um, another factor we also see in some member states is then the um, the blockages maybe that come from from the existing suppliers who are afraid of losing markets. Yeah. So again, it's a process uh, through m some other countries already went through it, but we still have countries where this is still happening. We have seen it uh, um, when the clean energy package was negotiated. Yeah. But this is now happening at, in, inside certain member states. And again, it's delaying the legislation, I would say, uh, whether these fears are justified or not. But mm -hmm. there is a this is th there is this element. And then maybe the third element, which also applies for the central and uh, um, East European member states, and you mentioned it yourself, specifically for energy communities, I think there is this maybe perception from the citizens that the term sounds a bit social, socialist, a uh, socialist. <laughs> and that's something maybe which is not as, as attractive to the citizens. Yeah. But it might be particular when it comes to the terminology. Mm -hmm. And certainly, it should not be a reason against consumer empowerment. But when people hear cooperatives and these type of words, they maybe have um, uh, some connotations that we don't have in other parts of Europe. Yeah. yeah. And then maybe another uh, final, and not wanting to any excuse anyone, but you mentioned the administrative capacity, which is limited in cities. We also see limited administrative capacity at national level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, member states have been fighting the biggest energy crisis ever. They've been trying to, you know, deal with so many things at the same time. And um, in fact, it's small teams of people who are dealing with gas, electricity and uh, the market and consumers and coming with uh, new legislation to remove barriers to energy community. So there is also the administrative capacity uh, 
which in my view exists at all levels, including uh, here in Brussels, of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah, no, sometimes I wonder where are the people, where are they employed? Because we are doing this green energy transition and we should, be, we should have resources, no? But somehow we don't have the resources. I don't know where these people are. <laughs> they are in the wrong sectors. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Well, one thing is that uh, there were these very enabling frameworks in place, and then people invested in, and then you know the state or the government or the the DSOs got surprised that that so many investment happened that they cannot cope with it. So it's certainly some capacity was missing when they were modeling the enabling framework and the impact of the framework. So that's one thing. The other thing, what I wanted to say that, as, I mean, I don't know how it is in, in other countries, in Central Eastern Europe or in Europe, but I haven't had the chance to use my utility but they have been changing me. You know, they were uh, swapping. The, the, I, I, I didn't do anything in the last couple of years, but I had three different gas and electricity utilities uh, logos on the bill. So it's, uh, I mean, as you said, Adela, I mean, it's not my choice who I I take the energy from. It's their choice who they supply to. It's which is uh, which is which was not the intention whatsoever of the the Energy Liberalisation Act. Uh, and you know, we we complied with it in 2008, 15 years, and nothing happened, and it went backwards. Stavrula, yes. Maybe just to address this question from a more practical um, um, perspective. And maybe on that, I wear my hat as a member of an, on an energy community in Athens. Um, so the question was about urban areas. So Athens has five million people. There is no space for solar panels. Um, not everyone has roofs. Um, a lot of people are tenants. So, of course, there are some practical challenges with these activities and engaging people on energy, share, on energy communities. There is lack of trust often into working together into a common cause, especially if in countries that this concept is completely new. And there is definitely lack of information on what energy communities are. I'm having a very hard time explaining my parents what I'm doing for a living. <laughs> um, so energy communities, yeah, in, in my bubble and in my working environments, uh, we talk a lot about it and what the benefits are for people, but people don't know the benefits. People don't know what an energy community is. So it's very important that people have uh, access to an entity at the national level or in the municipal level to just get a flyer with basic information on this is an energy community this is what it offers, and this is how you can get a project. And in order to get the license for that, you have to go in this place, not in 100 different places, and get 100 different papers and all these administrative procedures that we discussed about. Um, and problem that we also faced um, massively with Hyperion um, is access to finance as well, because energy communities it's a non-for-profit initiative. The activity of its own that metering, it doesn't generate any profits. You just sell consume. So we were going to all the different banks in, in Greece and not single one of the banks wanted to give a loan to the legal entity. Um, they were willing to give a loan to the person, to me or to another participant, but not to the legal entity as such. So this is also why we were talking about the importance of at least supporting energy communities, at least for the beginning, to start with their projects, um, and the importance of the country uh, explaining also to the banks what are those initiatives and the need for financing. Um, 
yeah, I leave it up to here for the challenges. <laughs> Thank you, Savrula. And I, if I can, if I can jump on this one, it's also uh, why many cities are setting up one-stop shops. Uh, that's exactly to address this issue. We have many examples of cities that decided, one of which is the city of Poric that I think was mentioned in uh, that presentation in Croatia. They recently set up a sunny office just for the citizen to go there and receive all the information that they need. But they are not the only one. Valencia is also se setting up uh, energy offices in different mm -hmm. neighborhoods so the, cit so the citizen can go. So this is, there is already, many cities are aware of these issues and are doing something to address it. So I think the trend overall is positive and I hope that we <laughs> we are getting there because indeed same problem as you Savrula my parents also don't understand and in Italy we have energy communities we have also big energy cooperative uh, which is also uh, providing energy to households so but my m most people uh, are uh, that are not familiar with the concept they are scared they say okay but then if I have a problem what is going to happen so it's uh, it's really important to provide the knowledge uh, and uh, and the, the space also to address uh, uh, concerns of citizens in this, uh, but I don't want to steal too, many, too much time. I see that there is other question for Antoine. Could you elaborate which digital tools are useful for operators to optimize grid operation, ensuring development, promotion of energy communities? I see there is a lot of likes on that question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm still going to be very concise because I would like also to be able to answer um, the third question, which is still on, the, on here, with the um, which role the industry can play in the energy communities. Can I answer that as well yeah. as at the same time? Great. Of um, so basically, um, grid operations, I'm not going to enter into the details, but um, system operators don't like um, to be surprised when the crisis happens. Uh, so we like to know upfront. So digital tools, uh, talking about data, we, know, we like to know um, 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 uh, what's there installed. So we need to ingest a lot of data on the assets that are installed. Um, we want to know also what's foreseen. Uh, so we want to forecast what we're going to uh, generate what we're going to consume also in the energy communities uh, how are these uh, consumptions and productions going to be netted in that energy community so to understand what the impact is going to be on our operations on the congestions uh, on our grid um, uh, um, um, especially so um, th that's really one point but also at the same time how can we uh, make sure that we can steer by providing some uh, signals to the different markets. So it's a two-way communication as well. So digital tools is not only ingesting data, but also allowing to uh, provide um, um, the data back um, to the uh, energy communities. I hope that that answered the question. Otherwise, just contact me uh, later on to get into the details of that. Um, just on the role of industry, um, the role of the industry is huge. Uh, you think about communities as me uh, with my neighbor, uh, I'm not saying you. you uh, it's one. Once can one can think of a community as me with my neighbor or somebody living in my street. Uh, but think about the community of me, uh, part of an industrial uh, big player. I would go work every day uh, at that um, 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 uh, uh, facility, and I produce PV on my solar on my on my roof. Uh, but I'm not at home. Can I sell that energy to my um, to to my facility to my emplo uh, employer, um, which is going to be part of my um, uh, community? Can we do that kind of community as well? So it's really a cross voltage level communities that is going to be interesting at the same time because you will not be um, um, uh, a, a lot of households will be empty the the, the time that uh, sun is shining on the roof. So can we do that with um, um, other voltage levels, whether they are called a medium voltage or high voltage? Uh, but I think industry is going to play a major role, especially that we see that industries are going to um, electrify more and more to decarbonize, but um, uh, we see that electrification happening more and more. I invite you to read uh, uh, some of those um, studies on, on, our, on our websites, but um, you can see that industry in the future will be um, electrifying. So we'll need more uh, uh, energy. They can buy that energy from residential um, households. They can be part of those communities. And so we experiment that as well, and uh, the different market designs that we have in mind can or allow those use cases also to, um, um, to, to be realized. Thank you, Antoine. Yes, Vedad. Yeah, uh, I also thought to, to, to tackle those two questions together, but I will uh, just, to the third question, industry, I will just broaden it and, and say business. So in general, so how can be involved? So one way is also to get them on board and be in, uh, in the decision making and in investment. And we have a case study in Bosnia and Herzegovina in one of the municipalities where um, actually a sports club, uh, which is a business entity, is part of the energy community and they will um, 
also give uh, their roof uh, on the stadium to, to put uh, solar uh, panels uh, there, but they will, they will also uh, consume uh, uh, part of the energy. Uh, another project we have been working on, it's unfortunately just at a, at a study level, uh, which is about uh, generating energy from a biomass, from actually biogas. And uh, this touch based on the first Antoine's in the first round of, of the comments. So when we have too much of energy, so what we do it. So we have to ha somehow balance it. And in this project, we foresee that uh, this uh, energy, even though biogas is pretty much controllable in comparison to, to sun, wind and other uh, renewables, but to use this uh, part of energy uh, in uh, businesses where, for instance, heat is uh, needed even during summer, like uh, when you are doing with crops and uh, fruits, vegetables and so on, which need also a hot temperature even in summer, whereas uh, usually you need heat in the winter. So uh, business sector can also play a crucial role in balancing the intermittency of the renewables as well. Uh, I see there is the question on the industrial sites provide space for the production of electricity for cities, and I think it was just the case that you mentioned right now, right? So, um, Dimitri, a, a provocative question, I see. <laughs> Instead of rejecting large wind park investors in Crete, we could delay the energy transition. It is not possible to cooperate and share capacity. Uh, okay. <laughs> this could be a sensible question. It's very provocative, as you say, but the answers are easy and there are more than one. So firstly, uh, as I said in my presentation, our target is not just energy transition. If our target was just to make grid green, to reduce our greenhouse emissions or to reduce our dependency or imported fossil fuels, then we wouldn't be necessary at all. Because the licenses that you saw previously in my slide have a total uh, capacity, total uh, power of 5 gigawatt. And these 5 gigawatt are for an island like Crete, which has a peak demand of 800 megawatt. So they are much more enough to undertake the full energy transition in Crete. But this is not our target. Our target, as I said, is to use energy transition to make it the level, the lever, the pylon for a fair economic and social development for all citizens in our island. So this is the first answer. The second one is that uh, we have to follow to apply the so-called fair play. So these licenses were uh, su uh, submitted and the, the applications were submitted and some of them were also licensed on the conditions that these, in these investors should undertake also the cost for the interconnection cables. And that's how they were excluded from the competitive processes. During the last years, the last 10 years, no other application has been submitted for Crete because of this application. So they were excluded on this condition. Now the cables, as I said before, have been constructed on the expenses of the Greek state. So you cannot be excluded for the competitive uh, processes and then you can also be allowed to implement your project without having uh, been uh, consistent with all your obligations you have to be recalled or rejected. And finally, uh, there is another uh, answer, of course. Um, okay, I forgot it. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Uh, actually, yes, I remember it. These applications and licenses, instead of accelerating energy transition, practically they have decelerated it. We haven't seen any new wind park installed or licensed in Crete or even in the other islands during the last 13 years. The first licenses or applications were submitted in 2009. Until then, it is uh, published, it has been published in some, in at least two of my scientific articles in uh, journals with very high uh, impact factor. Uh, we had until then very high, highly positive common opinion of the local citizens in favor of wind parks. Since, the, since then, and of course due to these uh, large size applications, not only in Crete, but in the whole country, and especially in the insular country, the, this common opinion has been totally inverted, reverted. So um, 
even now, for example, they are trying to go to install some wind masts because they are obliged by, by the manufacturers to provide wind measurements because down there we have very strong wind potential. So the manufacturers of the wind turbines oblige them to um, force them to, to install a wind mast of 40 meters height. So the local residents do not leave the staff, the technicians, to go and install the mast. So you, I'm completely convinced that there is no chance for any one of these wind parks to be installed in Crete or in other islands. So actually, they cannot accelerate energy transition. On the contrary, they decelerate it. The only chance to see new wind parks in Crete and in Greek islands is only with the participation of the local communities. I see no other way. And this is uh, kind of the perfect conclusion for uh, for this session, in the sense that, uh, uh, that in the end, why we are pushing for this, why we are supporting this, it's because it's not just about the energy, it's not just about the flexibility, it's not just about the knowledge, it's all of it together, and overall, uh, it's, uh, it's all about giving citizens uh, the power to uh, master their own energy and to uh, be, let's say, the, to, in the end, it's all about democracy. Uh, I don't know if anyone uh, has any uh, better concluded remarks than what Dimitri just said. Uh, if not, I uh, thank uh, everyone for assisting to this session, also to the people who are online. I'm sorry if we couldn't address all the questions, uh, but I I'm invite you to connect with the speakers. You can use the portal of uh, the European Sustainable Energy Week also for that. And I hope to see you at another session soon. Thanks. Thanks.